Acts 15, 12 says, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon Peter has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles, Cornelius, to take out of them a people for his name. You can read all about that in Acts chapter 10. And with this were the words of the prophets agree. Amos chapter 9, verse number 11 and 12 says that the Lord will return. And when he returns, it will set in motion a couple of things. After this, verse number 16, is a quotation of Amos 9, 11. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. The reason that David's tabernacle fell down, and I know that someone's going to hate me for saying this, but it's not the tabernacle that they worshipped at. It's talking about his house, his household, his prodigy, his children, his legacy. The, the house of David fell. And it fell because Solomon, David's son, who loved the Lord, but also loved peace. And his way of making peace was to marry women from all of the tribes around him and make peace with them by marriage. And that backfired because those women were loyal to their gods and led um, Solomon it, because he loved them and they were loyal to these gods, then he, these girls would say, oh, honey, would you build for me? I'm sorry, I can't do <clears throat> that too long. You are so wise and so wonderful. Would you build something? You're awake now. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to get me started. <clears throat> These wives wanted temples for their God. But when Solomon dedicated the temple that he built for Jehovah, the one true God, he began by dedicating it and saying, God, when your people call on your name at this temple, then hear their voice. And if they disobey you, forgive them. And if they follow after foreign gods, forgive them. When they pray their prayers to, towards this place or in this place, you know, and he begins to go on and on, and after he's finished and makes sacrifice, God visits him for the second time, and this time when God meets him, he says, I've heard your prayer and I've answered it, but I'm telling you right now, if you or your children follow after the gods that are around you, Malek, uh, if they follow Chemosh or all these uh, uh, other gods, if you begin uh, to worship them and follow them, then I will break down the house of David, which I promised him that he would never lack someone on the throne. You will be torn down. And, of course, Solomon worshipped those other gods. And, of course, God uh, kept his word and tore down the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. Not, again, a tabernacle, not necessarily a temple, although that is to come. But he's not talking about that. Now he's talking about raising up 
a, a, a descendant of David to sit on his throne. So I'm just going to remind you that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins. He was resurrected to impart new life to us by the Holy Spirit. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father to assume the throne of his father, God, and his father, David. So let me read the verse again. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that... The reason for it is so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. So James is hearing all these testimonies about the Jews coming in, and he's hearing from people who were formerly uh, Pharisees, but now they believe and they want the Jew, they want the Gentiles to become Jewish by virtue of circumcision and keeping the law of Moses, and it's creating turmoil. It's creating a Jewish Christian faith and a Gentile Christian faith, a divided house. But in this council, after hearing testimony. James says, this reminds me of what Amos prophesied, that when God raises up David's son to the throne, then the rest of mankind will come and seek the Lord of Israel. In Acts 15, verse 18, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those who from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Verse 22, yes, then it pleased the apostles and the elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also called Barsabas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren, and I'm going to add in Jerusalem. These were, these were prophetic and apostolic men who were associated with the church in Jerusalem, the Jewish church. And in Antioch, this is where the question arises. Let's send people, not only Paul and Barnabas, but let's send people with them and let's write a letter and tell them the good news. Verse number 23 they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. In other words, we didn't send them. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you from our beloved, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. They didn't have the internet. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And I'm just going to stop here for a moment and say that since the Reformation of Martin Luther in, 15, the, in uh, the, the 16th century, 
since that time frame in which Martin Luther went after uh, justification by faith alone, one of the things that was unintended is that, that, that Christianity, particularly Western Christianity, has uh, adopted a belief, which is accurate, that we are saved by God's grace through faith with nothing else. It's God who saves us. We don't have to do something to earn it. It's given to us as a gift. But we've read that like there is a period and not a colon because the colon says these necessary things. Number one, you abstain from things offered to idols. Number two, from blood. Seems easy enough for me. From things strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. Farewell. Okay. So I'm just going to stop and say that the problem, as I see it, is that they went with a letter, and with this letter, they said, you are free. Just as it was reported to you, Jesus can save you by his grace alone. You don't have to become circumcised. You don't have to become a Jewish. You don't have to be a person who is in church. You, you know, this is not what saves you. But... Having been saved, we want to warn you that there is something that has always troubled us. It has been a snare for us, and it will be a snare for you. And that is that any time we started worshiping idols, any time we went after idols and stopped worshiping the one true God, any time our heart was anything but absolutely devoted to the Lord our God, we ended up doing things that we never thought we would. We would start sacrificing our children to Moloch. We would start following after the traditions of the heathen nations, of the pagan nations. And, you know, this, this idea of uh, becoming adulterous towards God, loving other gods, which are not really truly gods, then would lead us into sexual immorality, which leads us into creating even more gods. <clears throat> Hello. So in other words, you, you have to understand that every time we as Jews went into idolatry, we ended up in sexual immorality and our societies fell apart. So we're asking you who were Gentiles who came out of worshiping idols to worship the one true God. So don't, don't buy those things that were sacrificed to idols. Don't eat those things. The reason is because they were not prepared properly and they were offered to, uh, 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 you know, another deity. So uh, we, 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 we don't want you eating that food. Because that will lead you to eating things that has blood in it, which means it, it was not drained of its blood, which is something that God told Israel a long time ago, that the life of our human bodies is in the blood. And so, therefore, the blood became sacred. So you become very attentive to... Um, uh, uh, things like murder. Murder is shedding innocent blood. You can't do that. You must not do that. Uh, the, the pagan deities, they reveled in blood. I just do not understand Halloween. For the life of me, normal, rational, sensible people at this time of year start going crazy. There is no reason for you ever to be ashamed because you lift your hands and worship God. But anyways, that aside, I'll just say that, that the pagan lifestyle and worship always ends up glorying in blood, even drinking blood in, 
satanic occultic rituals. It's, it's, so uh, the idea is if I drink the blood, I've, I've actually taken power over something. I've gained a power over something. It's demonic. It's ugly. It's, it's disgusting. It's supposed to be. And God taught Israel that a long time ago. So don't eat meat that's been offered to idols. Don't drink the blood that has been offered to idols. And don't give in to sexual immorality. Because that's where we, as Israel, that's where we went wrong. Because when we entered the promised land, there was a guy who wanted to curse us. And he hired a would-be prophet. And the would-be prophet came out, and every time he tried to curse Israel, he ends up blessing them. And finally, in frustration... The king of the Midianites said, what am I going to do with you? I'm giving you money to curse them. You, you come out and you bless them. What am I going to do with you? And then Balaam says, okay, I tell you what, this will work. Trust me. Introduce the Moabite women to these men, and they will have sexual immoral relationships with these women and they will lead them into idolatry and they will lose their standing before God and be defeated before you. So brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you that the problem in the West is that we have accepted justification by faith, but we don't know what to do with sanctification. We don't know what to do with consecration. We don't know how, because every time I tell someone, you know, you're not supposed to do that. Every time I'm counseling a young couple that's going to get married and they've been living together, I'll say, I've got five reasons at least why you should not be doing this because it will not create this God-honoring environment in which God can make a covenant with you and bless your marriage. And when, I'm, when I begin telling them, then they begin pushing back on me and saying, I wouldn't buy a car without trying it first. And I said, for God's sake, your wife is not a car, you know. It's, uh, anyways, but any, when, we, when we get into that rationale, we don't understand that, that, that it's not legalism, it's devotion. Every time we start talking about sanctification and presenting our bodies as a temple, holy to the Lord, people yell, foul, you know, legalism. And I am here to tell you, it's not legalism. It's devotion. It's devotion. And that's all that the Jewish church in Jerusalem was trying to do, is to tell these God-fearing, wonderful Christian Gentiles that if they abstain from that, they will be consecrated unto the Lord and show their devotion and their love. And guess what? When they received the letter in Antioch, there was not sorrow like, oh, you're being legalistic. No, there was joy because it brought freedom. It's like, I never was comfortable with all that stuff to begin with. Does anyone hear me today? Could you stand up with me? Hallelujah. Okay. Shortest message in a while, but I will just tell you this, that I believe with all my heart that there is a ministry of reconciliation that has been given to the church. One part of it says that God will save you. He loves you. And there's another part of it that has to do with consecrating ourselves in, and being devoted to him. Being devoted creates more and more Freedom. Now let me just speak with you very candidly. In my own life, my own life, you know, like when I accepted Christ as my Savior, he put my feet aright. Has anyone ever been to the dentist and had your teeth cleaned? And after you've had your teeth cleaned, then the next thing that happens is like, you're going to eat a meal sooner or later. And it's like, dang, I just had my teeth cleaned. Now I'm going to eat something. I'm going to have to clean them again, you know. And it's 
that same thinking sort of entered my mind. It's like, okay, I've been forgiven, and Jesus has accepted me. That just blows my mind. He's forgiven me. He's accepted me. He loves me. But then, what if I sin? Like, needing my teeth cleaned all over again? You know, is, what if I sin? Well, the scripture says there's a prescription for that. We confess our sins, and God, who is faithful and just and justified, will forgive us. Like when he forgave us the first time, he'll forgive us again and again and again. And then I find myself in a place where it's like, the longer I go, the more the Holy Spirit just kind of walks through my heart. And he says, Rich, you're loved and you are forgiven. But the way, the way you just handled that situation, is that the best representation of you? Is that really how you want to represent yourself? And of course, when the Holy Spirit asks a question, he already knows the answer. And I say, no, that's not how I really want it. Well, let me just put it this way. Is that what Jesus would do? Is that how you imagine Jesus living his life? And I say, look, you know, there's a lot of things I can't imagine Jesus doing. I, I can't imagine him typing on a computer and answering a cell phone and sending text messages and stuff. But the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit sends me text messages sometimes, you know. But that's another story for another day. Do you understand what I'm saying is that when you think that the Lord has cleansed you He has. When you think that the Lord has loved you, absolutely. When you think that he will never, ever leave you or forsake you after you've accepted him, oh, that's that's absolutely true. But can we be honest between us here and just say, I feel like that the Lord deserves better representation from me and there are times when I think something I shouldn't think when I say something I shouldn't say I see a pattern of something that I shouldn't see and I start searching my heart and say you know God can you forgive me again and you know the Holy Spirit is so faithful he's like That's not even a question. Of course, of course. The question I have for you, Rich, is have you found any joy in that? Have you found any life in that or not? I was going to say I'm going to just talk to the men right now, but it's men and women. Like, I don't know how you can be on the Internet and not run into porn. It's just everywhere. It's like, what do you do with that? How do you handle that? Let me just tell you, it's a trap. Let me tell you, I'm free from it, but it's a trap. But here's here's my freedom. I can't look at it. Like, I, I just, I just can't. I just cannot view someone's naked body who is not my wife and walk away and say, well, I'm glad... I don't need that. I'm just way too human. Now I have a suspicion you are too. And I'm using that one because we don't usually talk about that one much. But you know, the thing is, we've got things that are so close to us. And this country has more idols than Athens ever dreamed of. Which is another conversation I don't have time for. But if you, like me, are here today and say, look, I want to, I want to have a red letter day today. I, 
I want to consecrate my heart to Almighty God forever, for now, through eternity, and give the Holy Spirit permission to keep me on task. I'm going to just say, I don't need covenant eyes. Maybe you do. I have a Holy Spirit living inside me. And he has covenant eyes and holds me on a very tight leash. And I am, I'm glad for it. Because there's more freedom in consecration than running wild. Father, I pray right now in the sacredness of this moment that you would speak deeply to our hearts. Today, the issue is not justification. The issue is consecration. Devoting these temples that we live in to be filled by the Holy Spirit and to glorify God. If you're feeling pressure and kind of uncomfortable, well, let me just first of all say I probably have not made anyone more uncomfortable than my wife who's wondering what I'm going to confess right now. Let me just tell you, the Lord keeps me on a very tight leash, and I'm glad for it. But if you're feeling pressure like, I'm not feeling that consecrated right now. I'm not feeling that devoted right now. I'm not feeling that I have given my body to become the holy residence of the Holy Spirit. If you would like to consecrate your heart to Jesus today, would you please tell him that? Just say it. Just tell him. Just tell him. Consecrate my mind. Let my mind think your thoughts. Consecrate my eyes to see purely. Consecrate my ears to hear accurately. Consecrate my heart to the very presence of the Holy Spirit. Come on. The Holy Spirit brought you here today because God loves you and he, is, he has died for your freedom. And you know and I know that there's only freedom in a heart devoted to Jesus. That's the only place you ever find freedom. True freedom is found in loving God. Give him your heart. Surrender your heart. Surrender your life. Surrender your body to become a temple. Brothers and sisters, we're getting word after word and testimony after testimony. We're getting prophecy after prophecy. God is ready to do something in central Pennsylvania, right here in Cornerstone Fellowship and beyond. And he needs, he desires, and he is worthy to have hearts that are fully devoted to him. Do you love money more than Jesus? Do you love your parents more than Jesus? Do you love your family more than Jesus? Do you love your reputation more than Jesus? Do you love anything? more than Jesus. Just surrender. I surrender all. I just surrender. 
in this moment. You know, I, while I'm praying here, if you want to slip up to the altar and begin to pray, that's fine. You can do that. You have my permission, my blessing. Just find a place and wrestle it through. Just surrender it. Yeah. Father, I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would hear my voice as you heard Solomon of old. Would you begin to consecrate a temple? Father God, I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would entrust to your people a message of reconciliation. And so come and fill these vessels with your spirit, with your wisdom, with your faith, with your power, with your purity. Come, wash us us, cleanse us, renew us, restore us, and cause us to carry a message that God wants the world to come home. Come home to Jesus. Come home to Jesus. Father God, create a temple that is pure and holy, that the Shekinah glory of God can dwell in, that sacrifice comes up from, that uh, in, like prayers uh, and songs and worship like incense before the Lord. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. Ah, I just have to read it. I just have to read it. I'm so sorry. Just a few moments longer. In this divine presence today, I'm going to borrow... Solomon's prayer. And I already told you it didn't work out right, did it? First Kings chapter ten. And then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed to their way that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built yet Regard the prayer of your servant and the supplication. Oh, Lord, my God, listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may be open towards this temple night and day, toward the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. May you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Here in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. 
When anyone sins against his neighbor, forgive. When your people Israel are defeated, forgive. When the heavens are shut up and there's no rain, forgive. When there is famine in the land, pestilence and blight, forgive. Moreover, concerning the foreigner who decided to join us, forgive. When your people go out to battle against an enemy, forgive. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land, forgive. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire that he wanted to, that the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he appeared to him in Gibeon. And the Lord said, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart Be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and uprightness to do according to all that I commanded you, if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. Is a promise, David. Brothers and sisters, I want to announce to you today that the Lord Jesus Christ has consecrated this house for his glory to dwell here. And when you sin and you pray, he'll forgive. When you disobey, he'll forgive. When you call on his name, he'll forgive. When you cry out to him, when your back's against a wall, he'll forgive. And I ask you to carry that message with you everywhere you go. And as you do, consecrate your own house for the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone say amen.